So we are in a series called Loving, what? Loving God Back. Every religion on the planet is mankind trying to appease God, trying to earn our way back into God's favor. Hopefully one day you'll die. When I was raised, well, you will die. Hopefully one day you'll die and go to heaven. I was raised in a religion where there was a question mark in your soul. When I asked the question, when you die, are you going to go to heaven or hell? Are you going to spend eternity with God or separate from God? Um, it, I don't know. I hope so. Is the answer you get? You may, if I asked you that question this morning, what would your answer be? And then for those who say, yes, I'm going. And then I ask the follow-up question, how do you know? And almost always the answer is because I'm a good person. I was raised in a religion that taught that, that doing good deeds is your ticket into heaven and you have to wait till you see God and then he will look at your life and then you'll impress him uh, profoundly with how wonderful of a person you were and then he'll let you into heaven. If that were true, then Jesus dying on the cross for our sins was a waste. God knows that you and I We'll never make it to heaven on our own. Because the Bible says the penalty of sin is eternal separation from God. But God loves you and I so much that he came down to the earth in the form of a man and he took our penalty on the cross for us. Can everybody just say amen for a moment? Because if we ever lose sight of what Jesus did for us, we completely lose our spiritual bearings. And then we're lost and searching and trying to figure out what life's all about and how, who's God and it's... And, why did Jesus die on the cross for us? When we lose our clarity of what Jesus did for us, we lose our humility and our thanksgiving and our joy. That's why we say around here, all we do is love God back because he loved us first by sending his son to die for our sins. And so salvation is a free gift. And so that exclamation point turns into an exclamation mark, a question mark turns into an exclamation point. Once you realize what Christ did for you and I, you live your life with an absolute amen, I'm going to heaven, and it has nothing to do with my goodness. It has everything to do with his goodness. Once that revelation, that's the gospel, that's the good news, that salvation is a free gift. All you have to do is receive the payment of Christ on the cross, and his credit becomes your credit. His credit rating becomes your credit rating. It's undeserved, unearned. Once that takes place, then we realize, we recognize, we come to a place where we understand that all the gifts and talents, the breath in our lungs, the intelligence of our minds, the creativity of our imagination, were all created by God himself. He created you and I in his image. That's why human beings are the only creatures on earth that can reason, that can create. that can know God because mankind was made in his image. Animals were not. And then God gave each one of us talents, special talents, gifts, and skills. And the purpose of these skills is for us to use them to glorify him. What does that mean to glorify God? I want you to see this on the overhead. To glorify God means that we do the very best with what we have to be a blessing to others. When you and I use our talents, our, music, our musical talents, our scientific talents, our research talents, our artistic talents, our intellectual talents, whatever talents we may have, whatever sphere of influence you, you are in, when you use your talents to the fullest capacity, it glorifies God. The word glorify means to shine a light on. So when you sing, sing with everything you have. I tell the musicians here at our church, if you play better in a bar than you do at church, shame on you. God has created you with the talents that you have. What, what does not glorify God is when we use our talents, but we don't use them, to say God is amazing. When I shine, he shines because I reflect him like the moon reflects the, 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 the light of the sun. And when we use our talents 
for other purposes other than the kingdom of God, we are wasting our lives. Because the truth is, I don't know if you realize this or not, but what the truth is, when we cross the threshold of heaven, there's going to be an award ceremony. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. It's a, it's a Greek word that was used in the Olympic trials in, uh, in Rome. And that is after the uh, race was run, the athletes would come to the podium and they would receive the gold, the silver, the bronze. They receive awards. That is what the Bema Seat of Christ is, is the award ceremony where Jesus will reward you for everything you did for his purposes in the earth while you lived on the earth with the gifts and skills and talents he gave to you. The first place we see the Holy Spirit coming upon people, and this is really important for you to hear because sometimes when we hear about spiritual gifts, we think they're kind of esoteric and mystical and woo, kind of out there and kind of intangible. The first place you see in the Bible where the Spirit of God came on people supernaturally to build the kingdom of God was in the Old Testament where the Spirit of God came on the craftsmen, the carpenters, and the people who worked with metals and the artisans. He said, I have filled these people with knowledge and with wisdom to do all sorts of craftsmanship so that they could build the kingdom of God. This is why we get into, like, into the sciences. It wasn't until about 100 years ago, science used to be studying creation to glorify God. Look how big God is. But what we've done over the last 150 years is use science to eliminate God from the equation of his own creation. And that the Bible calls the foolishness of man. Astrology is perverting the stars rather than the stars that show the plan of salvation. The stars glorify God. The, story, the stars tell a story, but they're about God. Astrology turns it into the stars being about us. It's all about me, you see. I am the center of the universe. So it's a perversion. Rather than us being the center of the universe, God is the center of the universe, and then he created us in his image to reflect him. Oh, isn't that just so beautiful? Once you understand this truth, you spend the rest of your life glorifying God. You love as hard as you can. You play as hard as you can. You research as hard as you can. You give as much as you can because you're reflecting the goodness of God to all of those around you. That's how your life glorifies him, is by reflecting his goodness and his kindness. Look what the scripture says. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever your task may be, work from the soul. That is, put your very best effort as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord, not from men, that you will receive the inheritance which is your greatest reward. Isn't that a powerful verse? It is the Lord Christ whom you actually serve. Now, how do we do this? I'm going to give you three things really quick, and I'm going to get out of the way because we've got a great testimony, and then we're going to have Dennis come up, who's got one of the most powerful spiritual gifts I've ever seen, and he travels the world displaying the goodness of God through his personal gift. So how do you use your gifts and talents to glorify God. And listen, teenagers, I know you're in here today. I'm telling you, some of the greatest inventions, some of the greatest feats that have ever been accomplished on the earth in every industry of life and in the Bible were done through teenagers and young 20-somethings. Um, and you may not know this, like last night, Pastor Mike uh, had a complete fail when he tried to give a, uh, a little icebreaker and he said, who, what's the age of the person who invented Facebook? And he was trying to, you know, show this younger generation that, hey, it was one of you guys that did it. And I don't know why, but they said they thought that Mark Zuckerberg was 87 years old and 65 years old. You see, young people don't understand and don't believe that they literally are world changers. Like, oh, well, somebody that's running a major corporation like that must be like 87 years old. No, actually, he's like 32 right now, but he invented it when he was, what, um, 20. I just read about Joan of Arc. She was 17 and led the French army to defeat the English. That's crazy. But that's the way God operates. He operates through youth because they're dumb enough to try anything. That's why he can use them. We're all like, oh, that does, that's not very safe. And the teenagers have already jumped off the cliff, you know, free, free falling. Okay, how do you do this? And I'm going to get out of the way. Number one, 
You've got to submit your life to God. That's the first thing you got to do, submit your life to God. Look at this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your logical and intelligent act of worship, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that it is good and acceptable and perfect, and it's plan and purpose for you. Now, for example, an instrument, like this keyboard right here. This keyboard is just sitting here waiting to be played, right? That's what it's used for. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't make a smoothie with this. It's not a blender. You wouldn't try to drive it. It's not a car. It's a keyboard. It's obvious what it is. God has created every one of us with something, a gift, a talent, and it's, it becomes obvious what you're called and hardwired to do. Now, the problem you see in this scripture we just read was these two words, living sacrifice. You see, that keyboard's not living but you are. If that keyboard was living, when Jesse went to play it, it could kind of squirrel away and run out the door. And that's what you and I do with God. That's why the first thing we have to do is submit our lives to God. Say, I am yours. Living sacrifices can run off. And that's what most human beings do with their talent. And then they run after fame and fortune and whatever else they're running after. And then the curtain falls and they realize they wasted their lives not glorifying God with who they are. That's the big tra travesty in life. So it's wonderful to submit your life to God. Number two, discover, once you've submitted your life to God, discover your spiritual gifts and abilities. And Jan Lennington is our ministry development uh, overseer. Jan Lennington is a, a senior leader in our house. She is just masterfully gifted at discerning what your spiritual gifts are and how to get you into a place where you can uh, succeed and glorifying God with your talents. And so... You can meet with Jan. Her uh, email is in the bulletin. Um, you can also go on our website, look for Jan Lennington. And the, she will help you uh, go through a, a gifts discovery test, which is also on our website. So you can go to our website. You can go to resources and find the gifts discovery test. And you can literally take an exam online to find out what your spiritual gifts are. Then you can connect with Jan, and she will help you find your slot, not just in the church, but also in the world where you and I are the salt and light of the world. We are to have the answers and solutions to the world's problems because we operate in the wisdom of God. And so look what the Bible says about discover, discovering your spiritual gifts and abilities. Just as each one of you, everybody say each one of you. You see, it's not just me that's unbelievably amazingly gifted. <laughs> Ooh, I know, you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep a wide berth away from you because you're about to get fried. No, God loves me too much. He'll rebuke me later, but it'll be kind. My job as a shepherd is to help you find out what, how God has wired you so that you can be a blessing to the world. You see, the quote, professional clergy are not the ones who are just supposed to be using our gifts and talents and everybody just say, ooh, ah. No, our job is to, is to serve you by helping you connect with God helping you find out what your spiritual gifts are and how he's wired you and then help you be successful and be a blessing in life. And you unleash the body of Christ all over the planet. And that's how God's glory reaches the ends of the earth. So don't be deceived thinking that your gifts and talents are for your purposes. They're for God's purposes. So look what the scripture says. Just as each one of you has received a special gift, a spiritual talent and ability graciously given by God, employ it in serving one another as is appropriate for the good stewards of God. Multifaceted grace, faithfully using the diverse, varied gifts and abilities granted to Christians by God's unmerited favor, so that in all things God may be glorified, honored, and magnified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Okay, this is the last point I'm going to make. So first, you will submit our lives to God and say, I am yours. Everything I have, everything I am belongs to you. Ah, all right, got that settled. Now what? Then you discover what your gifts and talents are and you become a father and son, father and daughter business. And God walks with you and you walk with God and he's flowing his wisdom through you. He opens up doors of opportunity in every area, in every industry on earth. It's so much fun 
when you finally make that connection. And then thirdly, you look for opportunities to use your gifts to bless others. There are two purposes for your gifts and talents, to bless the church and to bless the world. Look what this scripture says in uh, the book of Galatians 2. For we are his workmanship. Say this out loud. Say, I am God's workmanship. Yeah. Now, I want you to say it again, but I want you to really believe it. Say, I am God's workmanship. Do you know that word workmanship there? You know what it actually means? Masterpiece. The Greek word is poem. I am God's poem. Isn't that beautiful? I am God's masterpiece. That's why don't let anybody shame you. God gave you your personality, your gifts and talents, your eyes, the way you feel, the way you're wired. God made you uniquely and individually. For we are God's masterpieces, his own masterwork, and a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for God's good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us. See, this is why Satan came into the Garden of Eden and what he, his agenda was and he succeeded was to get Adam and Eve to disconnect from God as their source and say, live independently from the Creator. Because if you do, you'll become a lot, oh, talk about freedom. You'll be free. You don't have to be submitted to God. Just break that bond and be independent and live your life the way you want to live it. That was the lie in the Garden of Eden and the human race has bought it ever since. And the Bible says there's the way that seems right to a person, but the end thereof is death and destruction. But the fear of the Lord leads to life. See, submission to God is where the freedom actually is. And the peace and the joy and the strength. So you find people like uh, Donette Meredith, who's a member of our church here. And she's had a medical condition for many years. And uh, she went through a procedure and rather than uh, suffering and choosing victimization, she decided to turn her suffering into serving and turn her trial into a blessing. So, Donette's an entrepreneur. Ever since she's come to this church, I'm amazed at her creative abilities and how she, uh, she just creates, uh, she has ideas and she runs with them. But this one impressed me more than any other thing she's ever done, which she's done quite a few amazing things in life already. This one really amazed me because it was, a, it was a disease, it was a sickness, a chronic illness, and she was suffering, and she made a choice to turn it into a blessing, and she's glorifying God through her trial. Let's welcome Donna Meredith as she comes up and shares. Thank you. As I was walking down here, I was singing, I'm no longer a child of fear. <laughs> this is the first time that I have shared this story in a non-medical live setting. You know, on social media, it's sometimes a little bit easier because you're removed from the public. So bear with me a little bit. I was hoping that maybe we could get the picture of there the map. Great, good. So. The media would have us to believe that there are no loving, caring people in the world loving God back. But this map, this map hangs in my home and it tells a completely different story. But before I tell you that story, I have to kind of back up and tell you a little bit more about my chronic illness. For 49 years and eight months, not that I was counting, yeah. I was dealing with this chronic illness. It was a bowel issue. Um, that was very painful. It was very, very debilitating. Um, and, and I've had it since I was three months old. And by 2016, I was reduced to basically a liquid diet, which I could only really keep down for about three quarters of the time, and it was still very painful. So many, many doctors, many medications later, I was really only left with one choice. 
And that choice was to have a surgery, a very special surgery called an ostomy surgery, where they pull through part of your bowel, through your abdominal wall, and create a prosthetic colon, basically. It's a colon that exists on the outside of your body in the form of a pouch. Um, that was my only option. I had tried absolutely everything else. So December of 2016, I underwent this surgery. They weren't sure whether or not it would work, but thank God it did, and I was immediately more comfortable. I was completely out of pain, and I could eat anything I wanted. And I know, right? And what I wanted was pancakes. I ate pancakes in the hospital for three meals a day, every meal. What do you want? Pancakes. What do you want for dinner? Pancakes. I want pancakes. And it was glorious. It was glorious. Then I went home a little bit closer to Christmas, and I was recovering at home from my surgery. And as you can possibly imagine, that this surgery has a emotional or psychological healing that goes along with the physical healing. So I was at home one day and I was on my computer searching and I wasn't really sure at the time what I was searching for, but two things I found that day would come together to create a or spark a national movement. And that's what I'm going to hear to tell you about today. So the first thing that I came upon was a stuffed bunny. It was a stuffed bunny that lived in Scotland, and it was a very special stuffed bunny because it had a pouch. It had had ostomy surgery just like me, and I had to have it. I just had to have it, and I wasn't sure why at the time I had to have it. I am, I'm a practical woman. I'm one of those women who asks for a mixer for Christmas, and I really mean it. So I'm not at all interested in stuffed animals, but I had to have this bunny, and as you can possibly imagine, um, anything with specialty on it is quite expensive. And then just the shipping from Scotland was $30. So a small fortune later, I get a package at my door. I'm alone when I open this package. And I opened it and I was stunned. I was stunned at my own reaction because I'm not an emotional woman, maybe excitable. People might call me excitable, but I'm not emotional. But what I felt when I opened that package was this wave of comfort and playfulness and encouragement that was just profound. It was really profound. And not only that, but this darn little cute bunny, I wanted to show it to my family and I wanted to show it to my friends. And it opened a door for me to be able to talk about the surgery that I had gone through and what I was feeling and kind of, kind of what I was going through. So it was a catalyst for my emotional healing. The second thing that happened that day that I kind of found online was I found a support group of people who had had similar surgeries as mine and they met in Oceanside. So, oh, by the way, I, I think that, I want to go back, I think that one of the reasons that I was so profoundly affected by this by this bunny was because this was the first person being thing that, that I had ever met or talked to or seen who had had the same surgery as me. So I, anyway, I found a support group online and um, it was in Oceanside. And if you would have asked any of my family or friends or neighbors, how's Donette doing with this surgery? How's she doing? A hundred percent of them would say, she's doing great. She's doing great. And I was. I was doing great. So I didn't need a support group. Didn't need it. But I thought, eh, I'll go. I'll go just once to check it out, see what it's all about. So I drive up to Tri-City Hospital. I walk into this room that hasn't, the meeting hasn't started yet. Everybody's kind of just milling around and having snacks and coffee. And there were maybe 40, 50 people in the room. And Without anyone even speaking a word, I was so comforted. I was comforted by the idea that here's a group of people who are thriving, who have had a similar surgery as mine, and they know exactly what I'm feeling. They know exactly what I'm going through. And I was so comforted by that, that I continued to go. And I still am a regular part of that group. Now, here's where those two things come together. 
So I started to think about, you know, if I was so profoundly affected by this bunny, how much more would a child? And come to find out, Rady's Children's Hospital here in San Diego does 120 ostomy surgeries a year on children, 120 of them. So I designed a teddy bear. I designed a teddy bear who had also gone through this surgery who had, that has a little pouch attached to his belly like a prosthetic colon. And I took it to my group. And I suggested to the group that we sponsor a bear for every child who goes through this surgery at Rady's Children's Hospital. And the room at the time was set up in this gigantic U-shape, you know, the tables in there, you know, 40, 50 people standing around, and I'm standing in the middle talking. And while I'm talking, I'm passing this bear around, and I'm watching grown adults laugh and giggle and play with this bear. So I finish talking, and I sit down, and I came home and told Les this. I said, I sat down, and these people got up and threw money at me. They threw money at me. They were so excited to be a part of this positive movement that would affect children like it affected me. So this is a project that we took on and we continue to take on. But what happened, and why this map is up here, is because I started to get phone calls and emails from other children's hospitals from other groups, just like mine, across the United States that said, hey, I, I, we want to do this in our community. We want our children in our children's hospital to also have these little bears as soon as they have surgery. So, Chris, do you have the picture of the little girl? So then I got this picture. This is a girl who lives in Arizona, and I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. Her name is Charity Grace. And this is the exact moment, she's in the hospital and she has had this surgery, and this is the exact moment that she received a bear that had a surgery just like her. And her mother and her nurse, of course, gave me permission to share it with you today. But when I received this picture, I wanted to quit my job and just do this. <laughs> so I have this picture hanging in my home, and it just is a reminder of the amazing abilities of God to orchestrate things for good. So let's go back to the map. So my middle daughter had this idea. This is a gigantic map that hangs in my home. You know, the old school kind with some of you are old as me. <laughs> Remember in grade school where they used to pull down the map? Well, it's a map that big. And she suggested that I take little teddy bear stickers and I stick them wherever I send um, bears to children in children's hospital across the United States. So you can just see some of these pictures and they even creep into Canada just a little bit and this has really exploded. So even though the media will sometimes tell us that there are no, there are no people loving God back. There are no people who are caring for one another across the United States. It's just not true. I have a map here that hangs in my home that says otherwise. Um, how much? Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So um, how many bears have you sent total? Um, close to 1,500. <laughs> that is awesome. I know, a lot of bears. 1,500 love bombs. Love bombs. That's love bombs. What those are. And I pray over them when they go out that the Holy Spirit will be embodied in this bear and that his light will shine. You are a perfect example of what we're talking about today. You know, you're not a professional clergy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -mm. You. No, I'm standing up here shaking. Yeah, yeah. Hey, when I first stood it up, my first time, I was so glad parachute pants were in style. The real, you remember parachute yes, pants, the big bag? Yes, sadly I my do. knees were like doing this, okay. and I was hanging onto the pulpit, and if it wasn't for the pants and the pulpit, I would have just been melted on the floor. It's weird, but you did a phenomenal job today, by the way. Yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna. Another person who um, has taken the gift that God gave to him, owned it, submitted it to him, and has traveled the world uh, blessing people is Dennis McNally. We, 
we had him down yesterday uh, to prophesy. To prophesy in the Bible is in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, 12 and 14 is to speak spontaneously what the Holy Spirit is saying about an individual or an organization. And the Holy Spirit knows everything about you. Your, he knows your desires, your motivations, your, your fears, your pain, your, your joys. And he knows how God's wired you. So we had Dennis come in and we had just a room of about 17 leaders last night, yesterday. And Dennis and his partner, uh, Joseph, his friend, Joseph, is men he's mentoring Joseph, a 20-something. Uh, anyway, each person they prophesied over and to sit in the room and hear them say things about these individuals that we know personally, what their gifts are, what their passions are, what their calling is, and it's so unbelievably accurate. It's just amazing, this gift of prophecy. And Dennis, if there's anything, if I would use one word to describe Dennis, it is encourager. Let's welcome Dennis McNally. Come on. Great to have you in the house, Dennis. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, you got about 20, okay? I, I, I can't preach for 20 hours. <laughs> I better talk fast. <laughs> Good to be with you again, and it's been a while, you know. Don said I'm a friend of the house, and I am, but what happened was, is I. The last time I think I spoke, it was at the men's ministry, and he was the ping pong champ, and guess who beat him? That... So he hasn't invited me back because he's still, still upset about that. Let's, uh, let's look at the first scripture here. It's one that we all know, Matthew 28. When they saw him, they worshipped him. This, the house here, the gathering place, is a worshipping church. When I used to pastor, and I got, after I got delivered from pastoring, I got to run, go around the world. <laughs> pastoring is difficult. But uh, after 25 years, the Lord uh, released me. And, but anyway, when I was pastoring, we used to have at this conference with hundreds of people and leaders and stuff, and, and we... Worship was a big part of our church, and we used to bring the, the worship team from here for a number of years in a row. Mark would bring, and, and cause, because this house is a worshiping house. How many know that? You know, you know I, just the last song we sang was just wonderful. You know, the presence of God comes, and, and you guys are worshipers, right? One of the keys, the platform for talents and gifts is worship. Scripture says here they worshipped him and Jesus came and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, go. Two-thirds of God's name is go. Right? Think about that for a minute. So the, the platform for going, the platform for your talents and your gifts is worship. I know I, 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 I've been... Uh, prophesying for 40, 48 years or 47 years or whatever. And, and worship always enhances the prophetic anointing. But worship also, you hear from God on your own talents and your own uh, desires that you have as, as a Christian. Because we all have different gifts and different talents. Let's look at the next scripture. It's Acts 13. We'll go through these scriptures real quick. As they ministered, in the, in the NIV it says, as they worshipped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to, uh, Barnabas and Saul for what? Work. How many know that God has a work for you to do? Right? Worship. And then God separates us for the work. Whatever that work may be. We all have different talents. We all have different... Uh, places where God has us. Next verse. verse uh, this is 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 1. It says, pursue love. This is what this, the whole series is about. Loving God back. Pursue love. Who's love? God. God is love. So we worship God. We pursue love. And what? We 
This is, this, this is where the church has kind of missed it a little bit. In, in the NIV, it says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Many times, you know, we sing that song, oh, I want to see your face and not your hands. And, you know, your hands speak of, you know, gifts. And you know, don't be asking God for gifts. And, you know, just, just see his face and just love him. And don't be greedy. Be greedy. You need to be greedy. Eagerly desire what? Is that what the Bible says? You and I need to be greedy. The more spiritual gifts we have, the more we can bless people back. Right? Give me healing. Give me, you know, you know, I don't, we, we, we used to, uh, we, we went into Mexico, we had this big bus, and we used to take teams into Mexico, and, and, and our, our missions pastor uh, would, you know, I would go in with them, and we, there was a bunch of churches that we worked with, and we built a mission station, some churches and stuff. So I would go in, and, and, and I don't know how to hit a hammer, you know. My kids make fun of me. They, you know, I, I use a scotch tape to put everything together, you know, duct tape. And, and, and anyway, so, so, the, so I go, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm the pastor. I don't want to look lazy. So I would go in and try to, you know, and, and finally the, <laughs> the, the, the missions pastor came up to me, and he says, man, you know, you're just making a mess out of things here. Are you, are you, this talent isn't yours. And, and, and this guy was talented. He could put together an engine. He could build a house and everything. And, and we had a bunch of people in the church that were really talented in that. And he says, listen, I give you permission. Get out of here. Go, go, go prophesy over the pastors. Go, you know, go do what you do and let me do what I do and everything will be fine. And so I took that advice because, <laughs> you know, I wanted to you know, look like I was contributing. But I was contributing to my gift. And we had a, we had a group of about 14 pastors along the Baja there that we'd meet with. And I'd go visit them, you know, with an interpreter and, and do the talent that I did best. And they did the talent that they did best. They built churches. There's a mission station now with a big kitchen and showers and everything. But if I was going to do that, there would be nothing there. Because I don't have that talent. I don't have that gift. Some of you are gifted in that area. You know, a lot of times we think of spiritual gifts, the nine gifts of the Spirit, which is revelation and power gifts and speaking gifts. You know, they're divided up into three. But there's many more gifts than that. One of the best gifts in our church, we, we had this guy, his name was Bill, and he was a computer nerd engineer, computer nerd. He was an older guy, and he retired. And God spoke to him, and I believe God spoke to him. And he came to me, and he says, listen, my ministry is to fix the computers in this church and fix your computer. And I said, amen! Yes, that is your gift! I barely know how to turn on a computer. I'm probably a little better than Mark, but not much. Well, anybody's better than Mark, but... He finally got an iPhone. He had one of those flip phones. He still doesn't know how to use it. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. We can all prophesy, the Bible says, all of us. I'll pour my spirit out upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. We can all hear from God. We're all supposed to hear from God. Go to the next verse. Having then the gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. Use them. Don't sit on them. God doesn't like us to sit on them. Remember the guy that buried his talents. He wasn't happy. The way to love God back is eagerly go after gifts. Go after what's in his hand. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Right? It's his pleasure. He wants to give you gifts. He wants to give me gifts. Start asking. Start eagerly desiring. Let us use them. Prophecy, ministry. That, that word ministry there in the NIV is serving. And, 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 and my, fin, my friend Bill, he had a talent for serving. And I had this Sony laptop I was taking around to the nations. It was always 
I was always doing something wrong to it. It was always busted. I'd just give it the bill. A couple days later, it worked perfect. Because that was his talent. That was his gift. And he worked on all the computers and stuff. Didn't charge a dime. He was retired, had plenty of money, and he just wanted to serve. He wanted to love people. And, and boy, that was, that was great. So, you know, some, sometimes um, people ask, well, what, I'm not sure what gift I have. I don't do miracles and healing. What, what, what gifts do I have? What, <clears throat> what, what are you naturally inclined to? What's inside you naturally inclined? I'll tell you a little, quick little story. Um, I had a dream. It was when uh, my granddaughter, her name's Maggie, she's 11 now. I had a dream about two or three years ago. I dream dreams once in a while, but normally I have visions, because young men have visions. And old men like Mark, he has dreams all the time. But young men like me, vision. But once in a while I have a dream. So I had a dream of my granddaughter laying hands on the sick. And they and and me laying hands on the sick. And when we did it together, they got healed. You know, and, and so I mentioned to my granddaughter, she was eight, you know. Talk to her about it. But anyway, we were driving home from a soccer game. My daughter was driving, and I was in the front seat, and my grandson was seven then, and Maggie was sitting here, and we ran into an accident. So when we went by this accident, this guy was on a stretcher. He, he was on a motorcycle, and he was hurt on a stretcher. And, you know, my grandson's trying to look, and I'm looking and stuff. And here's Maggie bawling her eyes out. Bawling her eyes out. I looked at her and I go, healing. She wants this guy healed. She doesn't even know this guy. She's bawling like it's, you know, like, like it's her dad on the, on the stretcher. Naturally inclined. God, God, God puts things in us where we're naturally inclined to, to, for, for giftings. And she's naturally inclined for healing. Make sense? Teaching, exhorting, giving, that's a wonderful gift. We had, a, we had an entrepreneur who had his own business in our church. Thank God for entrepreneurs with a lot of money. Don't talk about money in church. You don't need to beg for money, but you should give, right? All of us. But anyway, we had this entrepreneur that with, with, his, own, with, with his own business and Later on, uh, after I passed the baton to a younger guy in the church, we, we bought this big building. Well, it was, a lot of it had to do with him. I took his wife to Africa with me, and, and uh, it was a big work there, and orphanage, uh, you know, 10, 20,000 orphans, and churches all over Uganda, and, and the rest. I took her, and so all of us, you know, we, we picked up one or two orphans. I, I helped these two orphans. And um, they, you know, they grew up, and, and I helped them. I, I helped, too. She went, and her, her husband's an entrepreneur. She looked around and said, I want 50, 50 orphans. And I go, amen. She had the gift to give, <laughs> and she had the finances to do it. Some of us are, are great givers. Some of us are entrepreneurs that know how to make money. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the church. The pastor said, All right, next, next verse. <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, they were, this is where they were in the upper room, and Jesus promised this. He says, but you shall receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses, loving back. It doesn't say you shall be worshipers. It says witnesses to me in first in Jerusalem. Jerusalem speaks of home. You know, when Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he said, uh, said I'd, I'd, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I want to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chick. So it has to do with home. So the first place our gifting should be used is right where we live. You know, if you have children, you have a wife, use your gift. You use your talent there. If you're by yourself, it's all right. You know, home, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Begin to stir it up. Billy Graham, what he did was, uh, 
Uh, he used to go out in the woods before he ever preached to one person. He used to go out and preach to the trees. What did he do? He was stirring the Jerusalem gift <laughs> at home. I, uh, when we were prophesying yesterday, I was prophesying over somebody with a healing gift. And I was remember Catherine Kuhlman. I was in her choir. Anybody could be in her choir because I don't know how to sing. But you know, I, I sing really bad. And, um, and anyway, um, but there was like 4,000 people in her choir, and all you had to do was, you know, go there and sign up. I, you know, it was, it was back in the early 70s. And, and, um, and what Catherine Coleman would do at her meeting, has anybody been to a Catherine Coleman meeting here? It's old enough. It's only old. Nobody. Anyway, they, they were far out. She had this guy named Dino that played a piano. It was a big grand piano. And then she had her choir, which I was part of because I wanted to be close to the stage. But she had a phenomenal healing gift. Phenomenal. People get out of wheelchairs and, and the rest. But one of the keys that she had to her talents was worship. She would come out in her uh, white gown and with a fan blowing. Hey, there. And, and, and all of a sudden she would sing how great thou art and the choir would sing and the presence of God would come. And then she would move in her healing gift. Some of you have a healing gift that you need to move in. But, but, but her platform was what we do here, what you guys have here is a gift for your, for your gifting of worship. So she would worship, and the presence of the Lord would come, and all of a sudden, you know, she'd pray for people or point them out, and they'd get a, lay hands on people, the power of God would move, they'd get out of wheelchairs, or she would have words of knowledge. So God's healing that person. I remember um, um, she, she, she said, somebody's being healed of MS, and this guy was in a, a, a whole body cast. He had so many diseases, and he was in the body cast, and uh, in the middle of the meeting, you know, his, she, she had mentioned that, and, and his body started shaking, but they thought it was just, you know, he always shakes. So they, they left him in the cast. They didn't get him. So they, they, they brought him home, and they opened the cast, and boom, he started running around. <laughs> I had him. I used to uh, uh, lead a Catholic charismatic group, so I had him come to give testimony. He'd bring his cast, and then he had a, pages of things, medical reports of how messed up he was, and he was healed of all of them right in the middle of a meeting, a healing meeting that Catherine Coleman pointed out. You know, but the platform was worship. So most worship churches, where they, they emphasize worship and, 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 the, and, and the worship of God first and loving God first usually have moving the gifts a lot more. They have a lot more talent, a lot more things that they do. And, and instead of what I call an entertainment church, you know, where people entertain you up front and sit down and we'll, we'll do the worship for you. That's not this church. We're a worshiping church. I've had you at our church. I know you're a worshiping church. So those talents and gifts that Catherine Kuhlman had were able to come forth. She, she knew the key of worship about in her gifts and her talents. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses first in Jerusalem, first at home, and then in Judea. Judea speaks of the house of praise. It speaks of, of the gathering place. Right here, we can move in our gifts and our ministry right here, right? With one another. I, you know, yesterday I brought this young uh, prophetic guy that's, uh, that, that's, you know, that I'm training and stuff. I've taken him to Mexico and other places. Very accurate, very good, and very accurate. And we moved in Judea. We moved in, t we moved in the church. And, and those talents are important right here, right? But, there's, but, but it also says Samaria. And I think John had mentioned Samaria speaks of the lost, speaks of out there, the lost out there. I was with... Uh, Last time I think I was here, I was with Mark, and we went to a, went to a sandwich shop, you know. And so I went in, the, I was hungry, you know. I, I wasn't thinking about witnessing or prophesying or anything. But if you hang out with Mark, he's kind of crazy. Have you ever hung out with Mark? He's crazy. He does crazy things to people. So, so there, there was a girl behind the counter, and she, 
looked a little bit wild, you know, and, and the rest. And, and he says something like, hey, has God ever talked to you? And she looked at him and says, I don't think so. He says, would you like God to talk to you? And she said, not an answer. She said, yeah, yeah. And so he says, well, I have a prophet with me. He'll tell you what God says. <laughs> and I said to myself, <laughs> I said to myself, I'm going to kill him. I'm just hungry. I want a sandwich. I don't want to go with that and do this. <laughs> So I'm going to kill him. Sure enough, God gave me a word for him. You can see, remember, she had tears. and so That's Samaria. We need, we need to begin to think about the lost. The Bible, not all of us are evangelists, but we're all to do the work of an evangelist. So the power isn't just for Jerusalem. It's not just for Judah. It's for what? Samaria, your community. I, w I was at a leadership conference in, at Bethel there in Reading, and I, this, this really impressed me. Their sanctuary is too small for who they are. They have a bunch of services. And so they were saving money. They, they had, this is what was told me, they, they saved like a half a million dollars to add on to their sanctuary. But they found out in their community that the police department needed finances. So they gave all 500000 to the police department. That's ministry. To Samaria that says hey the church and, and it's opened up all kinds of doors in the community obviously right because they were sensitive to Samaria and we need to be sensitive like crazy mark here to Samaria and a lot of times I'm just not in my prophetic gift you know I was kind of trained let's keep it in the house let's keep it in the house let's keep it in the house for the house it's good for the house. We had a great time yesterday, but it's for Samaria. And it's in the grocery store. You know, you walk in the grocery store and God falls on you, gives you a word of knowledge for the person behind the counter. Go for it. Take a risk. We need to be risk takers again. Amen? I don't care how old you are. You could be as old as Mark. You still need to be a risk taker. You could be as young as me. <laughs> and be a risk taker. <laughs> uh, and then the end of the earth. That's my, I like that one. The nations. I, I, got, I got this plaque, and um, I had some pictures, but I'm ill-prepared. I didn't know how to put them up there. And anyway, I needed Bill around. So, so anyway, I have this plaque. It's Revelation 10, verse 11. If, if you have, I didn't give you that scripture, if you want to put it up there. Revelation 10, 11, and the, an African guy, this guy named Joseph, um, he started off in this dirt floor. We went in there to prophesy over him now, and I, I went back to visit him a couple of times. He's got 130 churches now. He's, I mean, just unbelievable. And we prophesied over his wife, who had like a fifth grade education. We said she was going to travel to other nations teaching. And, and he, said to, he said to himself, Joseph said to himself, that's never going to happen. Man, they're missing that. My wife's uneducated. But she, she ran the school, and the school got up to hundreds and hundreds of people. She got well-known, and they, they paid her way to other nations. You know? so, so he says, I'm not going to question that. <laughs> question that anymore. And uh, can you get that? Revelation 10, verse 11. Um, anyway, it says, it says, you shall prophesy to people... Uh, nations, and, and then it says kings. And, and I, oh, there it is. And he said, you must prophesy again. This is the plaque he gave me. You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And, and through prophetic, the, the prophetic um, gift that God's given me, I've prophesied over one person, uh, like in Uganda. His name was Peter. He came by our church, and I, he prophesied. and says, you've got to come to our you got to come to our church and open up the whole country. Probably got the biggest ministry in Uganda and open up the whole country to, to, to us through one prophetic word. So I was, I, I was just talking to the Lord. And I says, the Lord, I, I, I've prophesied to people. I've been to many, many nations and tongues and, you know, I use interpreters and stuff. But you know what? I never prophesied over a king. 
How about a king, Lord? I wouldn't mind having a king. I have a picture of me prophesying over a king, but I couldn't get it up there. What happened was, is I, uh, we, we'd have these pastors meetings every year uh, with Peter in a place called Gaba, and, and, and it was just growing and growing. And this woman came in who, who was an apostle. Her name was Alice. And she came in, and, and, uh, and I didn't know her. Uh, I prophesied over, and I saw her as like an Esther, handing out a scepter, you know, to, to a king, which I didn't know she had relationship with a king in Congo. A couple years later, you know, she wanted me to come, and she's right on the border of the Congo. There's a river there, and so I, she, she has 50 churches. She was done. Um, she has 50 churches... She was, her husband was a, a, a Muslim, and she had like seven children, and she, be, she got saved. Somehow she just got saved, and she didn't know what to do, and there was no churches in the area or whatever. And so the Lord said, just start a church. So she started a church, and then she started another church, and then started another church. Now she's got 50 churches along the border. Well, this king that was across the border, there was persecution. They were going to kill him, so he came across the river and found Alice. Alice leads him to the Lord. He's spirit-filled king. And, and uh, in Congo, the roads, the roads don't connect, so the kings have authority. So, so anyway, so I'm... I, I didn't know I was going to go see a king this day. I'm ministering to her leaders and stuff. And she says, do you want to go pray for the king? He would like you to come. Yes! Are you kidding? A king? Are you kidding? I mean, my background's, you know, I'm, I was on my way to commit suicide 48 years ago. We ticked into drugs. I'm going to pray for a king? Yes! <laughs> that, so anyway, so we, uh, we, we went to the border and here, here's this river with alligators and stuff in it. They said there was alligators. I didn't see it. And we pulled this rope in this little boat. And there was a guy on one side on the Congo side with a gun and another guy on the other side with a gun. And that was the border. And uh, we didn't have a visa or anything, but we knew the king. So the king invited us. So we went to his place. He had a, a prison there and stuff. And, and uh, he, he had this throne the kings there have a throne with their name on it, and then there's a, a dead lion in front of the throne uh, laying, laying there. And uh, so I went up and I prophesied over the, over the king and stuff. And then I got home, and the king sent me an email. So I want you to come. Isn't that something? I mean, that's you know, a background, you know, I'm on my way to commit suicide, and now I'm prophesying over a king. That's God. I cheated through school. I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I hated public speaking. I'm talking about shaking. I got saved, and I had, you know, gloriously saved at 3 in the morning. Got hit. I didn't know anything to do with the Bible. And uh, so they asked me to give a testimony at this. It was called Battle of the Bands. It's in Hayward Plunge, if you know where Hayward is. Anyway... So they had like seven bands there. This was back in 19, early part of 1971. And, but there was one band there called Gideon's Army, and it was a Christian band. And they said, you know what, you need to, you, you need to come and give your testimony. Here, we'll have you give your testimony. I went, yeah, I want to give my testimony. So, but I, I hate public speaking. I, I always avoided it in school and forget it, you know. So, so I never thought about that, you know. And I didn't know there was going to be hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, and they're all smoking, either smoking dope or drinking or whatever. They're, they're all high and, you know, and the rest. And, and so Gideon's army, you know, they played and they said, and we have somebody that'd like to say something. And I, and I, w I went up and I looked out and I went, oh, bah, 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 this is true. Bah, 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 my, 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 my name's Dennis, Dennis Mc. McNally, and, and I, I have a, and then this guy was drinking this big quart of beer, and he says, speak up, we can't hear you. No exaggeration, the Spirit of God fell on me. And I went, who made the mountains? Who made the cloud? And all of a sudden, everybody was listening to me. And, and, and I just, I, 
And so the two girls that were Christians before me, who had brought me to this thing, that New Guinea, and I, I walked down off the stage, and they, they looked at me, and they said, you, we didn't know you could do that. And I, and I looked at them, and I said, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> so then I, I knew I was called to preach. It was in Samaria. Well, I've gone over 20 minutes here. Gone shaking his head. God's called each one of us. Not to prophesy to a king. But each one of us have talent. And, I, and I, loving God back, God, God wants to give you gifts. You're to eagerly desire gifts. You want the gift of healing? Him for it. You want to give the prophecy? Ask that you might receive. Take some risks. You're, you're, you're in a home group or whatever. I'd, I'd go into a home group when I first started prophesying. God would give me words. I, I didn't even know the Bible. But God would give me words for that person. I was just, well, what is this? You know? And so I would give them and they'd go, how did you know that? And I'd go, I don't know how I knew that. I didn't know how I knew that. It was a gift. You don't have to earn it to be spiritual to have it look at mark he's got a wonderful gift and he's not spiritual <laughs> somebody's laughing over there they know mark that's right no mark is spiritual he's naturally spiritual he's my one of my best friends and when he comes to our church he rags me oh so i'm just trying to pay back it's called payback love back have some love mark Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that we're worshipers, God, and worshipers, Lord, have talents and gifts that you want to explode in this church, God. You're preparing for an explosion. You're preparing for a real move of God in this whole San Diego area and all along the West Coast. And, and, and you want people that are moving in their gifts and their ministries before that explosion even happens so they can come into the kingdom very quickly lord i pray lord that that uh, this this thing of, of not asking the lord not eagerly seeking the lord it's not biblical we need to ask and keep asking we need to knock and keep knocking lord i pray for the gifts of the holy spirit to be released in this place lord like never before we pray lord we believe that this theme of loving god back with our gifts and our talents of you not something that john came up with lord it's of you it's a prophetic word for this house lord i pray that that this community would be touched by you through the gifts and calling of god thank you father thank you lord In jesus name Amen. Amen. Let's thank Dennis. Woo! Yeah, man. So if there's anything you've heard loud and clear today, I hope it's this. Don't waste your life. Chasing after the world and the applause and the acclaim of earthly things. Submit your life to God. Recognize that he's made you in his image and given you writing abilities and creative abilities and engineering abilities. Your intellect, your emotions, the relationships in your life, the positions that you have, they're all graced and given by God. Recognize that and then every day you get to spend your life investing in heaven. And when you see him, you're going to realize what I just said is the truth and you're going to Turn and thank me. Ha! Huh, I'm kidding. That's supposed to be funny. You're going to be so thankful that you did not waste your life on earth. Satan's putting shiny things out. Chase this, chase that, chase this. Chase God. And spend your life loving him back with everything you've got. He records and rewards every dollar you give, every prayer you pray, every time you bless somebody else, he's watching. Live your life that way. So what I want to do is this. Uh, Mark just came up to me and, and uh, felt like this is what he, the Holy Spirit might want to do. If you want to
if you want courage to use your gifts for the purposes of God, when you're in school, especially public school, to be able to be a blessing to others in his name, it takes courage to step out in his name. Or at work, in an ungodly environment, maybe with your family members. You've got to do it wisely, but courage is first. No fear. And then once you have no fear that I'm living for God and I'm going to use my gifts and talents for him to be a blessing to others, then wisdom will show you when and where and how and who. But what Mark was feeling was,